Hello and welcome to Box Office Chat, the weekly show from Moving Burner Entertainment where we discuss the top 10 films within the United Kingdom's box office. And this is for the weekend, August 24th to 26th, and joining me as ever is Stephen. What have we got at number one this week, Stephen? Yeah, in his second week, John, it's Christopher Robin starring Ewan McGregor, and its weekend gross was 2.1 million. Very impressive. It is very impressive. I don't know whether there has been an error here, Stephen, because it does say that the total grossing is just 2.1 million pounds as well. So, hmm, don't know how they're working that one out, because it definitely made money last week. I'm pretty sure it was number one last week. But it's two weeks in, as you did say, showing in more theatres this week, 673 theatres. I went to see this film a week ago, I thoroughly enjoyed the film. It was also an offshoot to an adaptation of a classic books in the animated series that I watched when I was a child. It all my favourite fluffy teddy bears helping out Christopher Robin in the middle of his midlife crisis. I say midlife crisis, I don't think he was in the middle of his life, I'm pretty sure he was only 40 odds in the film. But we see a fantastic little montage early on, as I did mention last week, uh, where it's a book taking the form of live action from the pages. That was great. Hugh McGregor, utterly outstanding as Christopher Robin. I thought he was fantastic. Hayley Atwell, very, very good as his wife, Evelyn Robin as well. Those two played off well enough, but I really did enjoy the way that he worked on the set with essentially thin air and made it believable. Talking to these stuffed pets with the original chap that came back to play uh, one of the poor, I always forget his bloody name, but he was, he's done it for 30 odd years anyway. I think his name is Jim Cummings, but that may not be right, Stephen. He did Tigger as well. I thought he was outstanding. He's just synonymous with these roles. He's been doing it for so long. His voiceover work is incredible. Uh, he moves his characters with life and soul. The other one that stood out, and I mentioned it last week, was Eeyore, played by Brad Garrett, or voiced by Brad Garrett, because he wasn't playing Eeyore. But he's just uh, such a monotonous negative little chap uh, but it's funny the way he does it he's always speaking dead down in the dumps negative and he's just monotonous I don't know what it is but it was really funny overall really good film I enjoyed the animation the visuals were incredible loved the score loved everything about it Hugh McGregor fellow Scott utterly outstanding actor and he really brings his A game to this one I don't know what it's total worldwide grossing is I'll let you in before I find out what it is Stephen because I have to do a bit of digging but very good film one of the things I picked up, John, um, during the week, this is after I watched this movie as well with my young daughter, uh, who thoroughly enjoyed this movie, was that um, they're all talking about its Oscar potential already. Such was um, the quality of this film. Um, I thought the storytelling in this was brilliant. It was something not seen in these characters before. I was also concerned as well. We got the film, the Domino Gleason one from last year, the yes. Goodbye Christopher Robin one, yes. which was more of a, a life story on A.A. Milne and the creation of his characters, inspired by his son, Christopher Robin Milne. Um, nevertheless, um, it's an actual better film. Um, I did like Goodbye, Christopher Robin, but this one is, it is what it is. It's all about the characters. And as you said, the original actor that voiced pulls back Jim Cummings. Such an iconic voice yes. for that character. Makes the character come to life as well. If the CG in this wasn't as good as it was, um, certainly the, the voice acting, from Jim Cummings um, really did bring this to life but um, the CG in this movie is phenomenal um, I thought they'd reached their sort of point uh, when the the Jungle Book film came out a few years ago but this has topped it in my opinion uh, everything about it Ewan McGregor as well the interaction between the character and these uh, CG characters was you don't really think about it that much um, because you think they're actually <laughs> this is going to sound crazy but you're gonna, you think they're actually alive um, it's that good um, the cast as well, John, fantastic. You know, Hayley Atwell in there, Bronte Carmichael, uh, Mark Gattis, Oliver Ford Davis, a, you know, a classically trained actor. Um, the list goes on. It's just Adrian a fantastic. Scarborough as well. Yeah, Adrian Scarborough as well, playing Hal in there as well. A uh, fantastic actor. Uh, the list goes on. I could be here all night. Roger Ashton Griffiths as well. I love yes. that guy. I remember he was in that um, Canton film. I'm pretty sure he was in that. But yeah, uh, you know, the list goes on. But. I went to see this during the week. Loved it. My daughter loved it. Um, it's one of those films um, we're going to add it to your Blu-ray collection. It's that good. I don't normally get them for specific films, but um, we thoroughly enjoyed it and um, we'll be looking forward to the Blu-ray release as well. Yes, yes. I don't think I'll be buying it in Blu-ray. I'll probably get it in digital because that's what I always do these days. I've gave up on Blu-ray, sadly. I don't know why because they're very cool looking on your shelves, but I digress. I've gave up on it. It's total gross, incidentally. 89.9 million dollars 
not that great off of a seventy five million dollar budget. It's been out in the United States since the fifth of August, so it's been out around about a month. So that ain't smashing by any means. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe that they are not connecting with it as much as the UK audience is. Certainly in the UK, two million pounds isn't that great either though, when you think about it two weeks in. But I thought maybe doing a little bit better. I don't know why that is, I don't know. Maybe it's just I'm not connecting with it or whatever, I've no idea. Maybe it's a competition. Mamma mia. Still in there, as we'll get to it in a minute. But I did, I thoroughly enjoyed the film, Stephen. She did say, visually, unbelievable. He worked miracles. I recall reading the interview with Mark Foster prior to the film's release, where he spoke about the trials they had faced, and certainly that Ewan McGregor faced, having to speak to Finn Air. They'd do a take where they'd bring in a teddy bear, and then they'd take it away, and he'd speak to Finn Air. So... To have him do that, it shows you the talent of a man that, that he did make it so natural. He, he's came a long way since talking to a, you know, a rubber gungan. Yes, you know? yeah, that wasn't very natural. He was looking up in the completely wrong direction. But hey, yeah. we've moved on from that, Stephen, and thank God we have. But we're going to move on from this film as well, because we've not got much more to say about it. On another film, which we've got even less to say about. Mamma Mia, here we go again. Still at number two this week. Gross £1.6 million. Pounds. Taking its total gross... To 59.9 million pounds six weeks in, as I did say, still shown in 633 theatres, down just 24. That's quite impressive. I've still not went to see it, Stephen. One thing I'll say, John, um, I, I think I've said all I've had to say on the movie. You know, I'm now being subjected to the soundtrack, um, you know, in the car, uh, thanks to my daughter. Mm. But, um, one thing I will say is um, what you don't really pick up in the film with the soundtrack um, that you can on, like the CD, is the, the talents of Lily James singing. Um, she's a fantastic singer. She plays the young Donna in the movie, who was played by Meryl Streep uh, in the original movie, uh, playing obviously the older version. She's just got a terrific voice. But I think they all have. You know, I think possibly that was one of the reasons they were cast. Um, I think Hugh Skinner, he played young Harry. He was he was another uh, talent as well in regards to his voice. And Josh Dillon, who played young Bill, I think that was probably the most iconic one. He sang the song, uh, Why Did It Have To Be Me, uh, the other song. And these are talented actors um, that were brought on board to play these younger versions of already established characters played by already established very good actors. And Pierce Brosnan, Colin Firth and Sterling Skarsgård as well, who's a, you know, a lot of people wondered why he would associate himself with a musical for his previous work. You know, he's a, he's a classically trained actor. Um, but you've also got to look, you know, I think he's one of these guys that just wants to tick the boxes in all the genres. He certainly covered the musicals, he's covered the Marvel films as well. I think he appeared in uh, Thor and uh, Avengers, the, the first Avengers film as well. So um, it's just a talented cast. I don't have really too much more to say about it, but I will say one thing. The actual soundtrack itself really does show the talents, um, the voice talents that is, of this cast. Yes, yes, I've not got much more to add as well, Stephen, other than to say that when you look at IMDb, the amount of ensemble performance yes, <laughs> in this film is ridiculous. There's got to be a good hundred there. That is just insane to me. That probably gives you an indicator of what they were doing in this film. Also, it would have been big set pieces of dancing, singing and stuff like that. I've never seen them. I'm not going to watch them now. His total gross is still sitting at three hundred and Nineteen million dollars. I think they've gave up on it as well, changing it. That's still from the nineteenth of August. That's about two weeks now, Stephen. I don't know what the hell's going on there, but yeah, it's still sitting around about that mark. It's doing outstanding over here, though. Sixty million pounds, give or take, a couple of tens of thousands. That's outstanding. So fair play to it. I'm not going to see it though. So I'm going to move on to number three film I did watch about two weeks ago. It's the Meg, gross one point five million pounds this weekend. Down 28.3%, up 18 theatres, and it's now sitting at £11.7 million after three weeks. That's not too bad for it's this not, film. No, it's not too bad at all, John. Um, this film, when it came out, didn't think it would have the legs to withstand a top five position after three weeks, mm. but getting another £1.5 million over the weekend is it's not bad going, to be honest with you. Uh, 6.1 out of 10 on IMDb as well. Average... But it's surpassing my expectations, I've got to be honest with you. Um, I don't know if this is just um, to do with Jason Stratham and, and his, um, or Stratham, and, you know, his pool. Um, he certainly does have a, you know, a fan base, very much like Dwayne Johnson, and he seems to, you know, pull the crowds in. Certainly in this case, he's done that. One thing I think that, um, that stands out is the visuals in this movie. Just seeing that overhead shot, 
of the the bathers and all that, you know, in their dinghies and rubber rings and stuff like that, yes. and you just see that overhead shot of the the Meg. Is that what you call it? Yes, is that the what it is? seventy foot Megalodon. Yes. Yeah. Um. Just you know, sailing right under them and they're unaware. It's just terrifying. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't like to come across this thing at all. No. Well, there Although, admittedly, I'm going to admit I have went to see this film twice, so, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, Jason Statham's got quite a pull for me. I've seen it twice. I think that says more about the other films within the top ten of the box office than it does about me. But, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed the film, I can't lie. It's a guilty pleasure. I do like a short film. I've seen many a short film over the years, and this is a good addition to the short film genre. Because it's not that bad a film. And I think you look at Rotten Tomatoes and that'll back me up. It's about 50-50, Stephen. It's an average experience. It's not a terrible experience. It's getting an average rating of 3.3 out of 5 uh, from the audience members and 5.5 out of 10 from the critics. That isn't that bad, really. It's exactly what you'd expect it to be. It's a ridiculous premise. Visually stunning. Utter escapism. That's what it is. And nothing more. And uh, listen, I've not got much more to say about it. It's doing quite well 11.7 million pounds is decent 315 million dollars worldwide as well off of a 170 million dollar budget or something that's not bad Dave from totally carries the film uh, out with him there's not a great deal uh, my second viewing of it I did see that Bing Bing Lee who played Su Yin uh, kind of a slag her after my first viewing says she was a little bit cheesy a bit cringe with the, the broken English but she's actually not too bad in the second viewing thoroughly enjoyed uh, Su Ya Sophia Kai who played Mi Ying uh, the little daughter of Su Yin. I thought she was one of the standouts. Brought a lot of humour with a little gallus uh, personality. So, yeah, not the worst film I've ever seen. Not the best by a mile either, though. Yeah, you know, I read some of the reviews, John, prior to the movie's worldwide release. Mm. And a lot of people saying it was a little predictable. I, I don't know what that means in a shark yeah, film because yeah, unless was... unless the shark's going to be a, the, the hero, um, <laughs> it's going to be very predictable. We know what we're going to get with a shark film, but... We're going to um, move on, John, to yes. number four this week. Incredibles 2. Um, you know, it's crossed another 1.3 million over the weekend. 51.9, just under 52 million in its seventh week. Um, I've talked the hind legs off this movie um, over the last seven game. weeks. Yeah, certainly, John. One thing I will say, I don't think it's going to have, you know, much more gas in the tank in regards to being in there for the next four weeks or so. I think it's going to maybe drop off after that. One thing's for sure, Brad Bird will be contemplating Incredibles 3 very shortly, I think, uh, with this success. This could easily have went the other way uh, if it wasn't done right. Brad Bird held back for almost 14 years with this sequel because he wanted to make sure he had a credible story that was um, going to be on par with the original or surpass it. I think it's surpassed it. I think it's a better film. Uh, it's a better story. I think the characters are more fleshed out as well in this one. And um, it was a thoroughly enjoyable movie to watch. And I think this is now paving the way for the third part in what I think will be a trilogy of these movies. Yes, I don't think it will have a huge amount of legs left, even. It's certainly still sitting midway up. Uh, and there isn't a great deal of competition out with it. But I think it's seen uh, its better days in the box office now. You certainly look at the films that are coming out very shortly, the likes of The Nun, which I can't wait to see. Um, the Seagull as well, Sir Sharonin film. Yeah. Predator, the Predator, Operation Finale is coming out, I can't wait to see that as well. A lot of good films due to come out and I think you will see some of the films that are sitting 5, 6, 7, starting to dip down a little bit. Incredibles 2 was a fantastic film, I think it was better than the original. Gave us everything we had in the original and brought it back and made it bigger, better. I loved the story, I loved the underlying themes that Brad Bird brought to it. It's just a classic Disney Pixar film, you get the superficial stuff that connects with children. You get the underlying themes that connect with adults. Not to say the superficial stuff doesn't connect with adults as well, because it does. That's what it's all about. I love that animated style. It's completely unique to this. You see it and you immediately know it's Incredibles. I uh, just love the humour. I love the little uh, Jack-Jack and the antics of him. Elastic Arrow, all the animation, everything about it was just fantastic. And I'm glad to see it's made 51 million, 50, nearly 52 million pounds after seven weeks in the box office. I the final thing I'll say is that uh, if you would have asked me prior to these two films release which film would have grossed better or higher, would it have been Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, or The Incredibles 2? I'd have picked Incredibles 2, but it surprised me that Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again has beat it. Uh, certainly it's been out around about the same time as well, and it's beat it by a fairly decent margin. That's not to say that it will end up beating it. Incredibles 2 may somehow catch it. I'd very much doubt it, though. So that was a real surprise for me. 
I've never seen Mamma Mia, so I can't say whether it's... <laughs> I can't speak about the cinematic merits of both films. Certainly I can speak for Incredibles 2, and I thought it was fantastic. But we're going to move on to number five. It's The Equalizer 2, a film I finally went to see. Uh, it's crossed £1.2 million pounds at the weekend, down 34.4% already in its second week. 521 theatres, and now sitting at a total gross of £4.5 million. Pounds. I thoroughly enjoyed this film, Steve, and I don't understand... Uh, the, some of the poor ratings it's getting. You look on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics 51%, top critics 39%, audience members seem to be siding with my side of things 71%, and nearly a 4 out of 5 average rating from 3,200 ratings. IMDb as well, it's crit more audience members skewed. You don't get critics on that site, and they're siding with me as well. Over 21,000 reviews, 7 out of 10. I thought it was a good film. Um, exactly what you'd expect Denzel utterly carries it he's just a f- phenomenal actor there's one moment middle of the way through the film where he's talking to young Miles Whitaker a character and played by Ashton Sanders and it's just classic Denzel he gives a rousing uh, speech to him basically asks him what the hell do you want to do with your life you want to continue uh, being like a wannabe gangster do you want to do something with your life and go on and be a painter and it was just a, an amazing speech loved the ending as well very Home Alone-esque where he's laying booby traps for the uh, the group of villains had antagonists and then taking them out one by one. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, John, uh, Antoine Fuqua, I yeah. think that's how you pronounce the chap's name. Um, yep, yeah, you know, I, I was a big fan of his um, film Training Day mm. um, from about 15, 16 years. It might have been longer than that, actually. And that was a terrific movie. Um, again, Denzel Washington appearing in that. Yeah. But you're right about the audience uh, ratings on IMDb, The Mirror. Uh, what's on Rotten Tomatoes, John. And that says a lot. You know, I think a lot of people came back to see this movie because the original was a great movie. It was. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is any better. i say it probably isn't. Mm. But it's not, a, it's not a flop either. The ratings as well are not that much different. Um, I think the ratings for um, the first Equalizer are slightly higher. But um, that, was a, that was a terrific film. When that came out, it really took a lot of people by surprise how good it was. But as I said, you know, I'm a fan of the, the director. You know, some of the stuff that he's done uh, in regards to Magnificent Seven, Olympus Has Fallen. Um, he's very consistent in his work. And um, again, he's, he's very consistent in this film. Not as good as the original, but still a very good film. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, certainly we've not got Chloe Grace Moretz in this one, which was a shame, but she served her purpose in the first film. In her place, I think it's more Miles Whitaker that I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Loved the side arc between him and uh, Robert McCall, played by Denzel, uh, when he's trying to drag this young boy out of the gutter and make him better himself whilst he's doing the, the more professional things that he does in the, the side. Much of the same stuff from the first film. You get that meticulous, structured lifestyle that he's got. Simplistic lifestyle, and then in the background he's doing crazy stuff. Amazing sets pieces as well, some amazing action sequences. One that sticks out in my mind is uh, when he's in a car, getting attacked with uh, some guy with a knife. Brakes, goes into a slide. Guy flies into the front, and he shoots him in the head. All in the one move. Amazing. Uh, but yeah, I've not got much more to add. I thought it was a very good uh, action, sort of a revenge vigilante type film. Denzel carries it by far the standout by a country mile but there was a couple of other people in there as well the likes of Bill Pullman yeah, I thought Tagnus Dave York played by Pedro Pascal he was a very good Tagnus wasn't in it for a great deal of the film but I think the first half he was in the background he was masquerading as a, a goody two shoes police officer who had worked and been with Denzel's Robert character in the past in the history then he outs himself as a guy who's been walking in the side doing hits on people for a monetary gain but he was a great antagonist as well, but not much more to add. We're going to move on to the next film in this week's box office chat. It's number six, and it's Black KKK Klansman. It's grossed £1.1 million pounds in its opening weekend, taking its total gross to just over £1.5 million. Pounds. It's shown in just 215 theatres, and that's a very decent showing for just 215 theatres worth of viewings or showings. I'm definitely going to go and watch this film. I've heard a lot of good stuff about it. Apparently, it's a biographic crime comedy film. It just looks amazing. I've seen the trailers, and I'm very impressed with what I've seen. I'll be honest, John. I've not seen the trailer for this yet. Um, I, I don't even know there was a trailer out for it yet. But um, it's got the name Spike Lee connected to it. He's a director. Yeah. This is a guy. Um, you know, I remember when Malcolm X came out. I absolutely loved that film. Denzel Washington again. Um, 1992. That came out. His career, when you look back on it, it's a very scattered career in regards to filmmaking. 
he seems to pick his moments for when he wants to do one of these type of movies and that's um, very much like Tarantino he doesn't just churn them out most of his career is based on documentaries short videos music videos that kind of thing a lot of um, you know the black artists in America that's the person they go to he likes a Kelly Rowland I think he might have worked with Michael Jackson at some point as well but he's got such a long history as a film director and this movie I don't know too much of the cast, I'll be honest with you. The likes of Adam Driver and Alec Baldwin in there, John David Washington as well. Um, I don't know too much about the rest of the cast, to be honest with you, but it is a film that intrigues me. I see Michael Buscemi's in there as well, Mm -hmm. uh, playing a character called Jimmy Creek. Uh, That'll be a very interesting role, I'm sure. But um, I don't know too much about it, other than it's a film by Spike Lee. I'm looking forward to seeing the trailer. I'll probably watch this after we, we do this show today, actually, and see um, you know if it takes my fancy. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I, I heard about it, Stephen. The first I heard, it was actually, heard about it was actually through Mark Ellis on Twitter. I follow him on Twitter. He came back from an early screening, and he spoke very highly of it. Indeed, he says it's one of the best films this year. It's about an African-American police officer from Colorado successfully managing to infiltrate into the local Ku Klux Klan with the help of a white surrogate who eventually becomes head of a local branch. Uh, the trailer was hilarious for me. It had a great blend of almost <laughs> seriousness, but comedy as well, if that makes sense. I don't know if it does. But it's crime, it's comedy, it's a biographic film. So it's right up my street. It's a period piece as well. And the period is also the 70s. It's pretty clear when you see the leather jackets and the big collars and the shirts and the afro. Um, Adam Driver looks amazing in it as well. Uh, the leading guy, I believe it's John David Washington's character, Ron Stolworth, he looks very uh, good as well. And anything Alec Baldwin's in is just, you know, it's going to be very, very decent. I can't wait to watch it. I don't know a huge deal about it either, Stephen. Can't lie. All I know is it's meant to be a fantastic film. The word of mouth is very, very good. And I am going to go and give it a bash. £1.1 £1. 1 million in its opening weekend over here for a film that most people over feel here won't have any real connections with whatsoever. It's a period American piece. But the Ku Klux Klan is very decent. And uh, certainly when you look at its cumulative worldwide gross, £25.5 million pounds or dollars, uh, off of a $15 million budget. It's not out very long. It's only been out just over a week or so, a week and a half. So it's doing well. And certainly when you look at uh, its gross in the United States, $34.1 million. So it's something that's connecting with them. It's already made inroads into making a profit uh, over there <coughs> alone that's something they're connecting with obviously because it's their history I don't know it's cumulative worldwide grossing because this bloody website's out of date and it doesn't give us anything beyond the 19th of August but the last time uh, we've seen anything of it's cumulative worldwide gross it was $25 million so you can imagine it'll be well above that uh, somewhere in the region of $40 million and on its way to making a healthy profit but yeah I'm going to go and watch this film can't wait at some point this week uh, and then I'll be able to speak more in depth about it next week. Yeah, I might just join you there, John, once I see the trailer. You know, in the background, we're actually playing the trailer, and it, it looks very impressive. It's, it looks very interesting in regards to the characters that are in this this trailer. Um, but just moving on, John, yes. to our next movie, and it's first week, The Spy Who Dumped Me. It sounds hilarious. Um, <laughs> it's weekend gross is 1.1 million. Yeah, this movie stars Justin Thoreau, Mila Kunis, and Kate McKinnon. And it's basically a movie, uh, Audrey and Morgan are best friends who unwittingly become entangled in an international conspiracy when one of the women discovers the boyfriend who dumped her was actually a spy. As I said, sounds yeah. hilarious. Yeah. yeah, it does. Sounds like something I would absolutely hate. Certainly you look at it, Rotten Tomato score, 49% from the critics, 42 from the top. But much like what we've seen with The Meg and The Equalizer 2, Audience score, 71%, so they seem to be getting more enjoyment out of it than the critics do. And that's not really surprising either, because the critics like a certain type of film, and the general audience members like another type of film. The more escapism, action, uh, comedy-centric films, they will like that. Critics will like more art house uh, films and serious and drama-driven films. This is a, an action-adventure comedy, and as you did say, you broke it down, Stephen, what it's all about. It's not something I would be that interested in going to watch. Looks like a rip off of Austin Powers to me, but it's <laughs> came with worldwide gross as of the 19th of August because this damn website won't update. It's 42.8 million dollars off of a 40 million dollar budget, doing very decent in the United States. And uh, I've not got much to add, I'm not going to go and watch it. I do like Justin Furrow, don't mind Mila Kunis, 
There's a couple of other people in there whose names ring a bell there, the likes of San Huyen and so on, but yeah, I'm not going to go and watch it. Yeah, John, um, uh, Austin Powers popped into my head uh, the minute I read that synopsis, but um, it's interesting to know that you know some of the, the, the reviews of this movie, um, they're very one way or another yeah. <laughs> some are rating it 1 out of 10 saying they walked out it was that bad and then you've got other ones that are saying it's a hilarious action comedy movie I think you've got to really be into uh, this type of movie whether you're a Kate McKinnon fan and Mila Kunis or Justin Theroux um, would probably take you to the cinema to go and watch this and perhaps maybe a little blinkered uh, in watching these movies um, I certainly was with um, just on the subject of Austin Powers I thought the second and third one were amazing at the time and then when I went back and watched them not that long ago um, I, I didn't really like them at all I just thought at the time I thought Mike Myers such a funny guy um, I kind of went in there with blinkers and I think this is what this type of movie is I think if you're a fan of these actors and the kind of genre uh, of this comedy as well it might appeal to you but it's just interesting to see that you're either giving it 1 out of 10 or you're giving it 8 out of 10. Yeah, it's a Marmite film. Yeah. And certainly, looking at some of the, the reviews I'm reading, Stephen, uh, not a lot of people do like Kate McKinnon, clearly. <laughs> Poor acting by Kate M. Uh, Kate McKinnon shows us the same one-dimensional, over-the-top character that dominates everything she does. Mila Kunis gives us a rehash of the same slightly dumb but mostly good-hearted character she does over and over again. <laughs> Amazingly lazy, lazy writing was the capstone of this cinematic turd. A turd wrapped in toilet paper for lazy see the following. Edward Snowden just happens to be available and able to crack a password. Passports happen to be in the glove box of a car. Authorities are seemingly unable to locate two idiotic Americans in Austria who don't speak German. (laughs) International travel is nearly instantaneous and doesn't involve jet lag, etc. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought we were going to get. It's a buddy flick, but not a very good buddy flick. It's a spy thriller, but not a very good spy thriller. A raunchy comedy. Mm. That's one negative rating. You've got other people saying it's funnier than expected. And it's a funny buddy pick. I ain't going to go and watch it though. Not for me, sorry. It's not the nice guys. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just going to move on, John, to yes. another actor that likes to play the same type of character over and over again. That's Mr Tom Cruise. He's back as Ethan Hunt, as we know. Yes. And Mission Impossible Fallout is in its fifth week. And it's just grossed another £900,000 over the weekend grossing 21.9 million very impressive actually for um i don't know if this is the sixth or seventh installment of this franchise number six, I think. um so it's mission possible six basically yes. and um it's it's done well we've talked about this for the last four or five weeks now john in the box office um i, I wasn't having a dig at tom cruise there he does these films very well um yes. that's the reason why it's been so successful because of him and because of his commitment to the character he really does put his heart and soul into this character certainly in those stunts that we see prior to all these movies releases we normally get those little snippets online of Tom doing his latest stunt and you've got to take your hat off to the man really puts his heart and soul into it yes he does and certainly in this one I think it's probably the helicopter sequence at the end that's the real standout stunt Uh, there's one moment where he's dangling underneath a rope he nearly falls and it manages to grab a hold of the rope and then comes back up and starts flying the helicopter. Now, you would think to yourself, right, that's a bit far-fetched. But I do recall watching a video of Tom driving an F1 car. First time he'd stepped in it and he'd done about 20 laps and he was sitting near F1 standard lap times <laughs> after about an hour in the car. Then he proceeds to get in a helicopter and does a loop-the-loop above the racetrack in a helicopter. So this is a guy who does know how to fly a helicopter. So... It's not that out there for the man. And as you did say, he does tend to play the same characters uh, again and again. But he does, he does it very he does, he does, he does it very well. He'd be fair to him. He's a real action hero. He's been about for about thirty years now. Credit what you think he's in his mid fifties. Certainly doesn't look it in this film. Uh, stand out by a mile, but you'd expect that it's all about Ethan Hunt. He's the primary character. And I did say in previous weeks that I was thoroughly impressed. And surprised by how good Henry Cavill was as August Walker, the villain. You know what you're getting from Sean Harris. He's just a outstanding actor. We've seen it in Rogue Nation, the previous Mission Impossible film, where he played Solomon Lane. Oh no, thoroughly impressed with the film. It's one of my favourite films of this year, actually. Certainly one of my favourite action films in a long time. The opening 20 to 30 minutes just zipped past. In fact, the whole film zipped past. Some amazing visuals, some amazing action sequences. A decent story, a brilliant antagonist, uh, the Apostles, just that as an all-encompassing force with a, a very fitting antagonist for Ethan Hunt and his crew of modern-day realistic superheroes, if you'd like. 
Doing very well here. 21 million, 21.8 million pounds is decent. It's done very well for the country of this size. And that's a decent showing. Don't know what its total grossing is at, but I think it's broke over about 300 million dollars or something. So it's certainly a very, it's, you know, it's broke over 500 million dollars. So it's a very successful film. It's one thing I don't really relate Tom Cruise to as an action hero, and I really should, because he does all his own stunts. When you regard, you know, the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone in those 80s and 90s yeah. movies as action heroes, and then you realise that they, um, they don't do a lot of the action themselves. It's, it's very unfair on Tom Cruise when you think about it, because he's been doing this for over 20-odd years now. Certainly in this franchise he's been doing it. Yeah, and you still don't regard him as an action hero, and I think that's maybe a credit to the actor. He's not pigeonholed into the one sort of type of actor. I've seen him in uh, different films, in films like Collateral, Minority Report as well. Yeah. Um, you know, he had he does have range, but a lot of people do shoehorn him into those roles of Ethan Hunt and Jack Reacher. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe rightly so over the past 10 years, yes, but when you look back at this man's career, um, I think he's more than an action hero, but he is an action hero as well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But... Um, the one thing about this franchise, I think what makes it work is introducing these new characters, the Henry Cavill characters, etc., yeah. but still bringing back the, the Ving Rhames uh, character of Luther um, and, and the other ones that were in it from the very beginning. And it gives it that continuity, mm. and um, but still keeping it fresh by introducing characters like August Walker. Yes, and even Simon Pegg's Benji Dunn, who's been a fantastic introduction to the IMF team. But we're going to move on to number nine, Stephen, which is Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. Summer's gone, and this film should be gone from the top ten, but it's still in there. It's crossed £910,000 for the weekend, down for just 5.6%. I wish it would go away, because we're done talking about it. It's still shown in 566 theatres, down 28, and its total gross is now, to be fair, an impressive £16 million. Pounds. Five weeks in... For a middling animated film, as I keep calling it, but I've never seen any of them, so I can't really say that with any real authority. It's done excellent. Yeah, I think this release as well, John, has gave the, the previous two movies a little bit of new lease of life on the, the DVD and Blu-ray. And certainly, you know, my daughter, she's got the, the, the first two parts now, now she's seen the third one. Interesting enough, this uh, third movie is the lowest rating of the three of them, so it seems to have diminished as you know the films were released. The first two seem to do really well. I think they were seven odds out of ten. This one's dropped right down to six out of ten. Mm. So obviously the standard of it um, is dropped. I think maybe I don't think we'll see another one of these movies. Certainly, I don't. Th- I can't predict that we're going to see a Hotel Transylvania four. But then again, Adam Sandler's involved. Anything's possible. Um, it seems to be himself and a long line of his movie buddies that he always has in his films anyway. He voices Dracula, as we know. And um, I don't know if it's got the legs to do another film after that, but certainly the first two films seem to be have done very well on its original cinematic releases and its Blu-ray releases as well. Yes, I've not got much more to add, Stephen. I probably would go back and watch these from the very, very start and see if it's something I'm going to connect with. But it may very well get a fourth film because it is. It's done quite well. I think it's done well across the board, all of them. So, yes, but we're going to move on to the final film in this week's box office chat. And it's Ant Man and the Wasp sitting at number 10 after four weeks. What a sad sight that is. £789,000 for the weekend, down 32%, shown in 471 theatres. And it's crossed now totally £15.49 million after four weeks. That's disappointing. Disappointing because it is a fantastic film. And a very fitting addition to all of the other MCU films. Scott Lang back with uh, Hank Pym, Hope Van Dyne, and then Janet gets introduced. We've got the uh, villain of Ghost Ava, and uh, obviously Sonny Burks played by Walton Goggins. I liked this film. I thought yeah. it was a very good film, but that's poor. One thing I'll say though, John, is that um, Marvel aren't hitting any panic button and abandoning all standalone films like a certain franchise is when it doesn't do well. You know what I'm talking about. Certainly, Stephen, though, I think I read that it passed the original one's box office, so it's still doing okay. Yeah, it's I mean, it is, it's, it certainly is a great film, John. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was um, a great addition to um, the Ant Man films. Um, was it as good as the first one? That's debatable. It's better in so many ways, but the original one was had a certain charm to it as well. I think the novelty of some of those uh, special effects from the first one still remains in my mind. Yeah. Uh, in this one, it, they do go, you know, bigger and bolder with the effects. Um, 
characters as well have stayed true to themselves. Certainly in the regards to the characters of Scott and Hope, there's that kind of love-hate relationship between the two of them uh, very early on in this sequel. Um, I've not got really too much more to say on the movie other than I thoroughly enjoyed it. And once again, this is going to be probably a Blu-ray release maybe at the end of the year, maybe November or something like that. Certainly will be a welcome addition to my Blu-ray collection. Yes, and that just brings us to the end of this week's episode of Box Office Chat where we break down the top 10 films within the United Kingdom. It was all very repetitive this week, but we'd just like to thank you for listening to us anyway. And we'll be back tomorrow with the Movie Burner News. Remember guys, if you enjoyed that episode, then do hit that like button, comment below and maybe subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already. If you want to follow us on social media for all the latest updates for Movie Burner Entertainment, then we can be found on Twitter and Facebook at Movie Burners. You can also listen to us on Google Play and iTunes at the Movie Burner Podcast. And last but not least, if you want to access all the latest written reviews and the occasional article, then that can be found on our website at movieburnerentertainment.org. Until the next time, goodbye.